Jed here is uh, from Washington State University. Uh, he played uh, football there as well. He'll tell you a little bit more about himself. Uh, anybody get accepted to Seattle University, University of Washington, or the University of Colorado? Go. All right. So I went to Seattle University, graduated from there, went to University of Colorado, and I teach at the University of Washington now. So uh, Jed uh, works for a firm called Brighton Jones, and they work with individuals on their uh, their, their finances. So he works uh, on, with individuals. I spent most of my career at a firm called Russell Investments, where I worked with uh, big institutions like Boeing and AT&T, and I worked with them on their, their retirement plans. So between us, we know a little bit about uh, money, and we're here to share with you uh, what we know. Uh, actually, it's going to be Jed sharing what he knows. I, I gave a talk here for the last three years on financial security, and I thought it was pretty good. And then uh, my daughter attended a talk that Jed gave. So I'm just uh, I'm just here for the introduction and uh, and to learn, um, uh, but but he's just got a fantastic program that I think we'll get a lot from. So if you would help me welcome Jed Collins. I appreciate that, and uh, truly, I don't know where exactly all of you are in your financial journey, but uh, we're going to go through a lot of subjects and topics today. Truly much more experience and expertise. I'm more the entertainer and uh, song and dance kind of guy. But I love to begin with a question. And I gotta turn the clicker on to begin with that. As you have begun your financial courses, you some of you may be able to answer this question. It's, it's a pretty straightforward one. I mean, it's not. I'm not trying to trick you or anything, but who ends with more money at age 65? Person A is gonna say, I'm gonna invest $5,000 a year in my late 20s, early 30s, and then I'm gonna stop. Then I'm gonna stop investing completely, I'm gonna do put in a total of $50,000, and I'm gonna go and live the rest of my life and enjoy it. Person B says, my 20s and 30s are for me. I'm gonna go have some fun, good time, but when I get to that 35, I'm gonna put in that same 5,000, but for 30 years instead of the 10 years and end with investing $150,000. So who do you think A or B is gonna end up with more money at age 65? Anybody, again, there are no wrong guesses today. A. There you go, A. From the left side of the room. B, all right. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you the answer right now, but as we begin, I want you to do two things. First off, you got a little sheet in front of you. Go ahead and write your name down. Write your name on the top of that sheet. I know that feels very elementary, but I want to share with you very briefly why I love starting with writing your name down. If you have any interest at the end of how I came to understand the importance of my name, I'll gladly share the story for the time being. As you write your name, the thing you see, you have to begin to be confident in. The thing you see is going to become your brand and your reputation, and you have to build trust in. When people see that, they have to be able to trust who you are. And lastly, that name, that thing you see right there, that is something that you're gonna have to make people learn. Every time you wanna become a professional, if you want to take on a project, you wanna have a growth in a company, you're gonna have to make people learn that name. So at, next to your name, write down A or B, who you think ends up with more money, and we'll talk about that at the end. Why we're here, what I'm passionate about is truly empowering all of you to be able to use your money. I'm gonna repeat that, use your money. And I put periods after USE because I want you to understand money, I want you to be able to strategize around money, and then I want you to be efficient with your money. Pretty crazy, that was all right? <laughs> Gotta start out with a win. So <laughs> use your money. We're gonna talk about why this has become more and more important we're gonna give you a cash management system that actually as you walk out of here, I'll give you a high level percentage of what's gonna go into each of your choice buckets. And then at the end, we're gonna start talking about a few money habits that you can actually take with you and engage with. So to begin, does anybody know what kind of car this is? Is it an Alfa Romeo? I, I honestly don't know, so I, I, I usually <laughs> ask. It, it might be Alfa something. Alfa Romero, I'm not a car guy, so I appreciate people who do know that because they have a hobby and I need to get more hobbies. But the train industry, anybody take the train up to school today? Anybody take the train? 
I came down from Seattle. I had the option to take the train. I still drove. It wasn't so long ago the train industry was the main form of transportation in America. People took it to work. People took it to go see your family. They took it on vacation. But sooner or later, people realized the long time it took to build train tracks and having a, route, a destination decided for them wasn't the way to get around. We invented the personal automobile. Why? Because you can get behind the driver's seat and it could take you anywhere you wanted to go. You didn't have to pay the whole long train track. Why I love this analogy is it's very similar to the biggest change that is happening in personal finance over the last 20, 30 years in that the train industry, or what you would call the pension system, social security system, has kind of become a little bit extinct or going to the wayside, not people's primary mode of transportation. We're going to this personal automobile, the terms you start to be introduced to are 401ks, IRAs, which are just individual 401ks, brokerage accounts. You are now sitting in the driver's seat of your personal financial journey. And the greatest asset that that gives you is this word called autonomy. Like I said, a train track has a predetermined destination. It's gonna tell you exactly where you wanna go. The company says, you come work here for 30 years, we'll take you into retirement. The personal automobile, it doesn't tell you where you wanna go, you are now driving. You get to decide not only where, but how you're gonna get there. Today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how we're gonna get there, but the biggest change and why this class is more important today than it was 20, 10, five years ago, is because all of you are now sitting in the driver's seat of your own financial future. When we begin, I love to begin with the end in mind. Everything is around goals. You come to class, you study to get good grades, to go to college, to get a good job. What is that end in mind? When I say rich goals around your money, I don't mean retirement. If any of you write down retirement, we're gonna come back there, we're gonna have a little conversation, I'm gonna shake you a little bit, we're gonna write down a new goal. Nobody's thinking about retirement right now. A rich goal is something that, number one, is reachable. You can't reach retirement right now. So something in the next week, in the next month, in the next year, you're going to be able to achieve. A rich goal is gonna be something that is individual. What school you go to, what you major in, what sport you play, what instrument you play, what your favorite things are, those are your individual beliefs and, and enjoyments. Your rich goal has to be yours. It can't be your parents, it can't be your friends. Your rich goal has to be something that you want. It's gotta be controllable, something that's gonna be within your grasp. People tell me all the time, I'm gonna throw a bunch of money in the market, I'm gonna become a millionaire. You don't control the market. You can't focus on something you can't control. What do you control? I love this, this concept called mow your grass. Mow your grass, what do you control? And the last one, perhaps the most important around your rich goal, is it's gotta make you happy. At the end of a long day, you've studied for a test, it's gotta be something that's gonna put a smile on your face. So, next to your name, write down a rich goal. Something in the next week, in the next month, in the next year, you can achieve that is gonna be reachable, something you want in your control and makes you happy. I don't care what it is. Could be get out of credit card debt, could be save $20, could be go to a concert, could be uh, buy, a, get a puppy. I don't know, it's your, it's your rich goal, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be financially related. It could be unfinancially related. But as you begin your journey, you should always begin with the end in mind. Now I'm gonna introduce myself. Jedediah Collins. I show these because I got to play seven years in the NFL. Went from Washington State, I was an accounting major, I was gonna go and be a CPA. All of a sudden, the, the football dream started to fall, and I chased it. But as you look at these helmets, you can kind of take them two ways. You can look at them and say, man, this guy was really good. He played on a lot of teams. Or you can ask, why so many teams? Why would you, why would you get, keep getting moved around? I look at these helmets and I see every one of them called me and told me my dream was over. Every one of them called me and told me to go home. They cut me. That's how I see these. It's all about perspective. But every one I walked into, every one of these locker rooms, I learned a lesson. I actually prided myself on engaging with a veteran. I have a whole other presentation called Rookie to Veteran around the 10 principles I picked up in these locker rooms. Where my life changed was the first day I was handed my big NFL check. Now, if I walked up to you and I said, hey, I'm gonna give you $100, what do you want to do with that? No wrong answers. Save it. You're gonna save it? Good for you. 
good for you. A lot of people see $100 and say, ooh, seems like a pretty good weekend. Seems like a new pair of shoes. She immediately went to save me. I love that. I love that. That was not me. Now, I'm going to be honest. If I told you I, I can give you $1,000, would you join her and, and save it? Would you start to spend it? What would you think? Save it? Now, if I walked up to you and I said, I'm going to give you $100,000, what would you do with it? Buy a car. Buy a car. <laughs> what kind of car? That Alpha one back here? Yeah, that was kind of nice. That was kind of sweet? Yeah. So it, it was introduced to me. I was handed a $30,000 check. My first thought was spend it. I received a check and it immediately walked out the door. I realized as an undrafted guy, as a no-name player, never gonna get a huge contract, I was gonna be one of those 70% of professional athletes that walk away from the game with no financial acumen, no, no support, nothing to show for the game but some bumps and bruises. I woke up in that moment after I had spent that check and I realized I needed to start to learn about money. I'd never been taught money. I was a spender. I got money, I spent money. That was the entire relationship I had with it. And I came from, I was an accounting major in college. I, I grew up in Orange County, California. I, came, I grew up around money, but nobody taught me about money. Full disclosure, that first check, I went and I bought an engagement ring. Very romantic, I know, thank you very much. We're coming up on our 10th year of marriage. But it was still the wrong financial decision. It was, and I told her that at the time and still today, but it was still that thought of how do I begin to see money? What was going to be my driving factor? I ask you, what type of or are you? Do you see money in a day-to-day -day process? Are you a spendor? Do you see money in that next year to two year time frame and start to become an, a saver? If I look at money and I say, hey, I wanna save up for a car. I wanna save up for a trip. I wanna save up for whatever. That is a saver. The third type of ore I needed to be introduced to and where I really started to understand was not only just working for money, but having money work for me and becoming an investor. Do all three of those words end in OR? No. But it sounds better when you say what type of ore. <laughs> you gotta go with creativity sometimes, not necessarily what, what's accurate. You wanna go with semantics and have an English teacher correct it later, by all means. So what type of ore are you depends on how long you're seeing money. Day to day, you're a spendor. Year to year, you're a savor. And if you start looking in a three, five, 10 plus year frame, you become an investor. And that was my first achievement. That's what I wanted to become. And as you look at the three decisions, you realize a lot of how you're making decisions is around this term opportunity cost. Is this something you guys are all kind of familiar with? Opportunity cost. Can anybody give me the definition of opportunity cost? People were not in their heads. Nobody's not in their head anymore. You just had it on your test. Yeah. <laughs> what was it? Oh, I said the test that I did not take. There you, are. Yeah, there you go. You have an excuse. Opportunity cost. Everybody focuses on the opportunity side. The opportunity cost is what I ended up choosing. That's not opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is what you're actually giving up. So when I was a spendor, I was giving up being a savor or an investor. As you go off to college, you're gonna be faced with this big predicament. What major do I want to choose? I love history. I wanna go learn what the ancient worlds were about, how they interacted, what they did. I love reading and writing. But I see these computers, I see MIS, I see the trajectory that we're on. I realize for a great career, I'm probably gonna to have to know some of this stuff. Or Aunt Nancy. Aunt Nancy was a nurse, she was a doctor, whoever she was, she spent her life helping others, supporting others, and really wants me to go into the medical field. This is your choice. There's no right or wrong choice. But what you have to realize is with this decision comes opportunity costs. You go be this history major, you're giving up what you think is gonna be the best career in computers or what Aunt, Aunt Nancy wants for you. If you're a little sweetheart, and you wanna make Aunt Nancy happy, you choose to be in medical field, but you're giving up these computers and you're giving up what you want. That's the opportunity cost of your decisions. This is the first kind of principle you're gonna to have to face as you become wise around your money. As I travel through the NFL, again, one of the greatest things I learned going from rookie to a veteran mindset was all successful people. Now I deliver to corporations, I deliver to companies, I deliver to colleges, high schools, NFL teams. I've realized the number one success trait, the number one thing that they all people have in common is their ability to value what they want most over what they want right now. 
going to repeat that. Their ability to value what they want most over what they want right now. Why I had you write your rich goal down is because that's supposedly what you want most. That's what you want most. Now, when you see these daily decisions, you're not sacrificing. No successful person that has achieved greatness sees it as a sacrifice. They see it as a prioritization. I want to go for what I want most. This is the first trait of success. I can value what I want most over what I want right now. If you wrote down your rich goal, you're already more likely to achieve it. It's another little tidbit. You want to increase it again? Hand it to somebody else. That accountability partner will increase your likelihood of achieving your dreams. As we begin, again, go back a step, wants and needs. We all understand this concept around money. We need to have fun, we need to eat, we need to shop, we need to get around. These are needs of life. But then you see the decisions around what you want. And what I want you to leave here today is understanding money is not a noun. Money is a verb, money is an action, it's an exchange. Every decision you make is an exchange that has to do with money, but money is the medium, it's not the objective. Your objective is your rich goals. Your objective is what you want. A little example I love to say is, I can go to a concert for $100. What's a concert you'd go see? Makes up for that, I mean. Who would you listen to on the way in this morning? Uh, Travis Scott. Travis Scott. Travis Scott's coming to, to town. For $100, you can go see Travis Scott. That's gonna be one day of work. You go to work for one day, you go to get to see the concert. That's the exchange. Money is the medium. You went to work, you got a concert. Money was the, the vehicle. Now, I tell you, hey, instead of driving or, or taking Uber or something, you take your bus to work every day, you can save $100 a month. Now, that choice saved you $100 and you got a free concert. See how money is just the middleman. The objectives are your choices. Okay, so I love this example around what you want and what you need. That's gonna be your first idea and seeing money as a verb in this money exchange. You got a series of choices in front of you right now. You got four choices to make. And this is as far as we're gonna get. You're gonna choose where you wanna live. You're gonna choose how you wanna be protected. You're gonna choose how you wanna get around and you're gonna choose just these bills and utilities. Your choices and then at the bottom, you're gonna add them up into B1. So you're gonna select one, select one, select one, select one, add them up. And then these are the money exchange. These are lifestyle points. These lifestyle points reflect what you are going to get from spending money because it's an exchange. You don't just throw money away, you get something for it. So then you're adding up your lifestyle points as well. If you have any questions, please ask. If you're questioning it, somebody else is too. calculators you're gonna need a calculator here in a minute so you can get those out I believe you all actually have calculators so some saying I'm gonna use my phone that's okay too I guess <laughs> all right we're ready to move on everybody's calculated this B1 and C1 category how much you're spending and how many points you ended up with at the end of month one. Back corner, you guys are good back there. Good. Got it. All right. We're going to move on. First question was, how was I seeing money? Why did I need to change my perspective? The second question I needed to realize was, how do I control my money? How do I begin to empower myself to actually be in control of my money? And I realized I needed a system. 
That system was going to be built on routines. Those routines were going to become my habits, and those habits were going to lead to my success. I was very fortunate to play in New Orleans for four seasons. I got to be around a guy named Drew Brees. At five foot seven, he's going to arguably be one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Not really five foot seven, but he's pretty small. <laughs> Why he was and still is performing on a great level is because he's built systems in everything he does, from what he eats to how he gets ready. And in 20 years of football, he was the only quarterback I ever saw do this. We'd go out, we'd have one-on-one -on -one drill, we'd have a seven-on-seven -seven drill, we'd have team drills. Every drill, he would drop back, he'd throw the ball on his first read, and his hands, his feet, his eyes would go to his second read, his third read, his fourth read, and down to his check down. Every time, that system, that process, that routine occurred. Typically, I was the check down guy. I never really got the ball, and so I'd do like a little song and dance, trying to make him smile. That was my routine. You gotta enjoy yourself here and there. But I asked him one day, I said, hey, what is the deal with that? Most quarterbacks throw the ball, look at it, and walk back to the huddle, get the next play. He didn't. He would finish out each thing. He said, in the game, when I wanna achieve, when I wanna find success, when I wanna score, I don't want my mind or my hands or anything to be thinking about what the progression is. I want that to be habitual. I want that to already be doing it without even thinking about it. Because then I can be present. Then I can be in the moment. Then I know I've built towards success and I can find it. And if you look at his statistics, his numbers, he's not wrong. The guy has performed at a high, high level. And it's around this idea of habits. I want to introduce you to a little psychology here. Habits have three parts. You have cue, which is the trigger. You have your routine, which is your action and your reward. What is the reward? Well, you wrote down your rich goal, I hope, so we've already begun that part. Why I show the example around toothpaste is, back in the day, not many people were buying toothpaste. A marketing agency came in and said, well, you have your first part of the, the habit. You have your cue, people know, go to bed, brush your teeth. Sometimes go to bed, wake up. If you learn anything today, you should brush your teeth twice a day. That's a win. So then the routine, go into your bathroom, brush your teeth, but there was no reward. Sure, the dentist was gonna lay off your back a little bit, but who really cares about their dentist? Apologies to any of you who wanna be a dentist. So what a marketing company did, they came in and said, we gotta build in a reward. So what they did is they put into toothpaste that tingling, fresh sensation. That has nothing to do with how your teeth are getting clean, but now when you walk out of the bathroom, you feel good. You feel like, huh, I get it. That's why I wanted to go brush my teeth, is for that feeling. So they understood the cue, the trigger, the routine was to go to brush, and how we we're gonna build a new habit was focusing on the reward. How you're going to build your new money habits, focusing on your reward. So now the cue is I received money. I have money, what is my routine? This is your first money habit, go ahead and write this down. Your first habit is typically how do I spend this? I got a $10, I got $100, I got $1,000, how do I spend this? We're gonna change that, this is what I want you to write down, is how do I use this? How do I, U-S-E, understand, strategize, and be efficient with this money now? That's my new routine. It's a simple thought, but it's a life-changing habit. And then you can focus on your reward, and your reward is personal, I can't tell you what that is. But understanding this process Again, very stupid, but I like stupid little acronyms. How would better I try something? Habits are telling your future self how you're gonna address something. So the first system we're gonna build is what this little process is called money buckets. You have five buckets. I don't care if you're Jeff Bezos or you're starting tomorrow day one at Amazon. Every dollar you make is gonna fall into one of these five buckets. Every dollar you make is gonna fall into one of these five buckets. And why I put choice at the bottom of all of them is because it's your choice, it's your decision. Society choice, what do you think that's gonna be? Taxes, sorry. We're gonna start with society. <laughs> Past choices, those are your debts, your bills. Present choices, this is how we're walking around spending on a daily. Future choice, future choice. And then compassion choice, how we wanna impact, help people. Every dollar you make is gonna fall into one of these five buckets. So, first aha moment, you guys all chose how much you wanted to spend last month. Why didn't anyone ask me how much their money they were starting with? First way to break it is start spending before you know how much you have. We're gonna talk a lot about that, credit cards, all that kind of fun stuff. But you all broke personal finance rule number one, the golden rule, you spent before you knew. So now you know, 
Based on your birth egg right here, you're gonna have $3,300, $4,100, or $5,000. That's gonna go into this monthly income. And as you write that down, <laughs> you've already calculated B1. B1 is gonna be your monthly choices. Moving down the left side, I have my income now. I have my choices. A minus B is gonna equal this box right here. The alpha, what's left over, however you wanna call it. Let's get to that bucket or that box and we'll stop right there. Did have a student on Monday who's an engineer at Washington State say he's gonna help me put this into an app so we can get away from paper, but for the time being, bear with me. So everybody's got this box, right? Now with this box, we have two choices. Again, choices. How much do you want to spend and how much do you want to save? How much of this box that you have left over do you want to spend? Again, you got to live your life. You got to enjoy it. You're not going to save every dollar that's left over. How much do you want to save of that? And how much of that are you comfortable with spending? So fill up those two boxes. <coughs> There's no right or wrong choice. It's your choice. How much did you end up saving? that, how much are you going to actually put in the bank? Oh. Okay. Keep pondering it. When you figure it out, let me know. All right. How we're cat categorizing this stuff Monthly, monthly points because you are going to get lifestyle. There's your C1. C2, the most confusing part of this, you're going to take this box and divide it by 10. If you looked at this, all these lifestyle points are simply the number divided by 10 because you're getting something as you spend. So if I spend $1,000, I get 100 points. I spend $500, I get 50 points. That's going to go into your second one. And then this random one, we're going to face here in a second as I tell you. Who decided, who chose the Range Rover? We got one, I like it. Good news, bad news. You got a sweet ride. You gotta get your uh, wheels fixed. It's gonna be $150 from your save. Range Rovers ain't cheap. Who chose to take the bus? Anybody chose to take the bus? Dang. <laughs> All the transportation. You're gonna meet a friend, you're gonna get some lifestyle points. You guys missed out? Who chose the Honda? Everybody else. Good news, you decided to start driving around for Uber. You're gonna get 50 extra dollars to throw into your spend or throw into your save. All right, here's the second aha moment. What was our first aha moment? First off, our moment was how much money we're going to make before we start spending it. Second aha moment. Are you ready? This is a good one. How many of you set aside money for taxes? No one? Well, the first bucket and the first choice we're going to have to understand is you got to pay taxes. You made money, you gotta pay taxes. We're gonna talk about that here in a second. So go ahead and take out 500, 700, 800 dollars, depending on A, B, or C, from your save. You didn't actually save that much money, you just forgot to spend it to pay taxes. So yeah, if you were category A, it's gonna be 500, B is gonna be 700, C is gonna be 800. So that first choice we're being introduced to is society, our taxes. We're going to start talking about gross to net. We're going to talk about the progressive tax income. Before we do, give me a good reason why we have taxes. Um, it funds social programs. 
Fund social programs. Excellent. Give me a good reason why we have taxes. Everybody gets very confused when I look at them. Yes? There's no wrong, no wrong answers, only good guesses. You don't have anyone? Anyone have one? Oh. Yes. Public education, excellent. Anyone else? Go. Infrastructure, roads, buildings, things downtown. Do you have one? Yeah. Infrastructure, excellent. What about the military? What about the policemen? What about the firemen and women? I got to deliver this to a lower socioeconomic category of, of students. Their first answer was welfare. Why? Because that's how they see taxes. Taxes help support their welfare. My personal introduction to taxes, I have a sister with special needs. Taxes help sis live. That's why I see taxes. Again, taxes, they're gonna take a little bit, but it's around good events. You make money, you gotta pay taxes. You have a home, you gotta pay taxes. You invest money, you gotta pay taxes. But taxes go to a lot of good causes and good things. So don't see taxes as a bad thing. We were just introduced to this idea of going from gross to net. You all spent on your gross income when really you got to see your net income. Come Thanksgiving, everybody goes and gets a 20 pound turkey. How much of that turkey do you actually get to eat? Um, 20, 20 pound turkey, how much actually makes it to the table? Um, mm -hmm. I like where you're thinking. You got to take out the bones, the giblets, the goblets. People in California remove the skin. My people are from Louisiana. We throw the whole thing in a deep fryer and eat it all up. But the idea is the entire turkey doesn't make it to the table. Just like with money. Gross income to net income. You want to Google something fun later? It's called a turducken. Check that out. Have you seen one? Yeah. yeah. Turducken. So you were just introduced to income tax. The federal income tax, I put 12%. Is every dollar you make gonna be taxed at 12%? No. Right now that's a high level average. We're gonna talk about why that is in a minute. Anybody wanna tell me what the state of Washington's income tax is? Sounders. No wrong, no wrong answers, just good guesses. Give the kid a dollar. The state of Washington has a 0% income tax bracket. I was very fortunate. I delivered at UCLA a few weeks ago. Those students walked out having to pay 5% to just live in the state of California. Their parents or people making higher income, that goes up to 10, 12, even 13%. So that is a big portion about living in the state of Washington. How the state makes that up, sales tax, other taxes, but that's a big one. The city of Seattle, you come work at in the city of Seattle, do you have to pay a tax to work there? Not yet, dot, dot, dot. We'll circle back on that in a few years. So I went and I was in the NFL, I'd have to go play the Philadelphia Eagles. I would have to walk in and pay the federal income tax, the state of Pennsylvania income tax, and the city of Philadelphia income tax. And before I walked off the field, they had taken upwards of 50% of my paycheck in every city and state I played. So think about that. Income tax, very important, gross to net. And then you're gonna be introduced to this term FICA. Not FICO, FICA, FICA. One of my favorite things every year as a rookie, people would open up their first check, get all giddy and excited, and their first question was, who the expletive is FICA? And it happens every time. FICA is part of that infrastructure. It's part of that government support system. Who's paying for unemployment? Who's paying for so Social Security? Who's paying for Medicare? That is why 7.65% of your check is gonna be taken out for FICA. So if you say, I don't have to pay state or city, 12% plus 7%, that's almost 20% right there of your check. And if you're not taking that out, you're spending too much money. Now, all of your money is not gonna be taxed at 12%. You come to the Jedediah uh, ice cream parlor, you walk in, what's your favorite kind of ice cream? Who hasn't spoken yet? You. What's your favorite kind of ice cream? Uh, chocolate. Chocolate? You can't get more creative than chocolate? 
All right, don't go with chocolate. One scoop of chocolate. I guess it's bad. Cookies and cream, there we go. Come on, live a little. So one scoop of cookies and cream is gonna be a quarter. And he says, I want one scoop of cookies and cream because he's on a diet and he respects that. You come in, what's your favorite scoop of ice cream? Mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. She says, I don't want one. The only thing better than one scoop of ice cream is three scoops of ice cream. I want to come in and eat all three scoops. But what I tell her is, I charged him a quarter for his first scoop of ice cream. I'm gonna charge you a quarter for your first scoop of ice cream. But that second scoop is gonna be 50 cents. That third scoop is gonna be 75 cents. I'm charging her more on her next scoops. Why would I do that? Anybody have a good guess? make more money sure probably maybe but I would do that because I want everybody to pay the same on their first scoop of ice cream I believe everybody should pay the same for their first scoop of ice cream just because she was fortunate enough to get three scoops doesn't mean he should be charged more or less on his first scoop our income tax bracket system is designed the same way anybody see that coming <laughs> All right, so the first scoop is 10% up to your first $9,525. If you're Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, he's paying 10% on the first $9,500 he makes. Now, as he gets a little bit more money, the $9,526, that extra dollar, goes into his second scoop bracket of 12%. Does that make sense? Then you get up to $38,701. Boom, you fall into this bracket, going down, 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 down. Now most of his money is gonna be taxed at this 37%. But the example, the idea remains. I think everybody should be charged the same on their first scoops. And just because you're fortunate to get more scoops doesn't mean you should pay less. Does this make sense? So if I make more money, will I end up losing money? No. The next dollar you make falls into that category. The previous money you made is untouched. Okay? Cool? Got two knots, three knots, all right. Questions here? The last question everybody wants to ask about taxes is all my money being taxed? I get it, I gotta go gross to net. I got, we got the progressive thing. What don't they tax? That's where we get into deductions. Deductions is the amount of money the government says you made it, but I'm not even gonna look at it, I'm not gonna tax it. You have two choices, the standard versus the itemized deductions. Anybody in here have a million dollar home they have a mortgage on that you are paying for, not, not your family? Is anybody gonna give $20,000 away next year? Anybody have medical bills that are really stacking up? So everybody in here will take the standard deduction for a few reasons, why? because they increased the standard deduction to $12,200. So let's go back for a second. I made $50,000. Is all my $50,000 gonna be taxed? No. No. I get a standard deduction of $12,200. So the government says, you didn't make 50,000. In our eyes, you made 37,800. So I look at my bracket system. Up to 9,500 is gonna be into the 10%. That next 20,000 is gonna be at 12%. And since I made 37,000, oops, I didn't get over eight. So if I made 38,800, that last $100 is gonna be at my 22%. Okay, so the standard deduction, which we're all gonna elect, if you want to itemize, you're gonna add up a lot of the expenses you have. Right now, it's not a part of your conversation, but that's the first question. <coughs> what is my standard deduction? What money is not going to be taxed? As we look at month two, what is our first aha moment? How much money are we making? <clears throat> Second one, we got to pay taxes, so A, B, and C. So in your top category over here, you need to put the net income, not the gross income, the net income, which is these figures. And then you're gonna make a series of choices this month. First one, everybody has credit card debt of $1,000. Everybody has student loans of $20,000. You are required to pay this month $20 to your credit card and $200 to your student loans. 
So when you add up, don't forget that $220. Then you make a choice around where you want to eat, around how much fun you want to have, and around where you're going to go get your workout in. Nine twenty. Social, do you go out every other week? Do you go out once a week? Or do you just go out? category now you see net income we got month one choices wait a minute those are staying with me yep go to your month one see how much money you spent in this box bring b1 with you then month two is what you just added up into month two b2 and that's going to give you what you have left over You have that bottom left box filled out. You have the same two choices. What do you want to spend? What do you want to save? Your choice. What do you want to spend? What do you want to save? And then we got two random events. Two random events. How many months are there? Who chose to save some money and go eat fast food? We got one, good for you, not a problem. Two. Good news, bad news, you saved some money, you got a little bit of sick, you're gonna lose 25 uh, lifestyle points. So, minus 25 lifestyle points. Second question. She wants to go to Travis Scott, who's a, a concert you guys will see? Chance the Rapper. Chase the Rapper? Chance. Chance? Chance the Rapper. So there's concert coming to town. You can go to Travis Scott. You can go to Chance the Rapper. Boom, boom, boom. They're going to do a duet. <laughs> you can go to that concert. It's kind of a nice concert. It's kind of a sweet concert, right? Back in the day, Nelly and I think Garth Brooks did a CD. Something like that. <laughs> Country and hip hop, they cross over every now and again. Hundred dollars. Who wants to go to the Travis Scott Chance the Rapper concert for a hundred dollars? There. We got a few. You guys aren't big Chance or Travis fans. All right. So these four, five. Do you raise your hand? Yeah. These five spent the hundred dollars. Take out your hundred dollars, either from your save or add it to your spend. But the good news is, they got a selfie with the artist Chance and Travis. And they got a hundred lifestyle points for going to that concert. So boom, random event, you got a hundred. The rest of you, that's fine. You got to save that money, but you didn't get the experience. Again, money is an exchange. Money is the exchange. You ready for the aha moment of the month? See, you're starting to get into it. All right. Just needed to wake up a little bit. I've been up since five o'clock. That's why I get so much energy. I'm almost four hours in. So, aha moment of the, the month. Who paid more than the $20 to the credit card bill? I said you were required to pay $20, but it was your choice of how much you paid. Why well, bring this up is because right now in America, 38% or about 40% of households have credit card debt sitting on their balance sheet. 
43% of students are struggling to even pay back their student loans. This is a subject we'll cover in level two, not one we can address today. This one we are gonna target. Why? Because it has to do with your past choices. It has to do with this idea that anything that is due on the first of the month is a past choice. That goes into that bucket, your choice bucket of past choices. So credit card debt, student loans, auto debts, you have a home loan, you have other types of loans. Those are debts, bills, rent, insurance, utilities. Those are past choices. Those are due on the first of the month. What you do this month doesn't have to do with those. You want a high level rule of thumb for where you're gonna live when you go to college, after college, never go over 25% of your net income. Net income. Never go, can you go below that? Absolutely. Why I wanna hit on credit cards because you guys are gonna be the first audience that these marketers are going after. When I swipe my debit card, where is the money coming from? Your bank account. Boom, when I swipe my credit card, where is the money coming from? Credit card company. The credit card company, not your bank. What is that credit card company sending? They're not sending cash from your bank. What are they sending? It's not a trick question. Credit. Credit is simply a promise. Credit is a promise that you borrowed money from me. I'll cover it for this expense, but you owe me money. That's what they're sending is a promise. Now, why can they charge you money for it? Say it loud. You guys have the right answers, you just can't keep it. You're borrowing it. You took out a loan. Anytime you use someone else's money, they're gonna charge you for it. They're gonna charge you interest. Now, as we look at, again, 40% of Americans have this interest sitting on their, uh, their balance sheet. What would you guess the average interest rate of a credit card in America is right now? You have an answer in the back. No, no wrong answers, just good guesses. Uh, the, can you average interest rate of a credit card. Nine. Nine percent, it's good, good, good guess. Mint chocolate chip. Average interest rate of a credit card. 15, anybody else have one more guess? 17, we're getting closer, it's actually 18%. 18% is the average. That means you don't have good debt, you don't have good credit, you're gonna be charged 20, 25%. So on average, people are paying 18%. That is the credit track. So these are four examples of how you can go buy that $3,000 TV for your dorm room. You can go pay for it in all credit, you cannot pay your monthly payment. I really don't even like talking about that example, we're not gonna do that. You can pay for it in all cash. You can have a monthly payment of zero because you pay for it in all cash. You can pay for it half in credit, half in cash. I got a plan, I'm doing half and half. Then I'm gonna do 10% of whatever's left. I'm gonna chunk it down until I get out of, out of the credit card. Or I can pay for it in all credit and my plan is to pay the minimum amount due and go spend my money elsewhere. Which one of these do you think falls into the credit trap? Let me define what the credit trap is. The credit trap is any time that $3,000 TV ends up costing more than $3,000. The credit trap is any time what you thought you bought ends up costing you more money. Which of these examples do you think falls into that? D. D. D? Anybody else? So A, bad example. You didn't pay for any of it back. It's gonna take you forever. It's gonna end up costing you a million dollars. You're gonna go broke, probably get arrested. Let's get by it. B, I went and paid for it in all cash. How much did that $3,000 cost me? $3,000. C, I had a good strategy, a good plan. I'm paying for it half up front and I'm paying good chunks of it. How much did that $3,000 cost me? Credit track. I may not fall into it, but I definitely did my toe in it and then I got back out. But still, I lost $133 because I didn't understand credit. Now. When you take a loan from your credit company, you owe them $3,000. They're gonna send you a bill that says you owe me $3,000. I don't want $3,000. All I want is $60, the minimum amount due this month. Why are they gonna do that? How much did that $3,000 TV end up costing? Almost double. The credit company wants you to simply pay that minimum monthly payment because that means the debt is still there and I get to charge you 18% off. Avoid the credit trap. 
First question everybody asks after that slide. Well, should I even be using credit? Yes, you have to use credit. You have to build up your credit score, but you have to use it wisely. You need a good credit score to go get an apartment, to go get a job, to go get a, a car, to go get a house. You need good credit, but you've got to use it wisely. So how should you use your credit? Use your credit card like a debit card. Use your credit card like a debit card. What does that mean? If it's not sitting in my bank account, I'm not putting it on my credit card. If it's not sitting in my bank account, because that's how a debit card works, I'm not putting it on my credit card. How should I treat my past expenses? We're gonna go back to the car example of autonomy. You can automate these. This is how you control it. This is how you build in the system. Everything on the first of the month that's due, I'm gonna automate that it's already being paid off. I'll never miss a payment. I'm gonna get all those cool rewards from the credit card company and they're actually gonna be free. I'm not paying for them. If you have money sitting on your credit card balance and you think you're getting free rewards, you're wrong. So as we look at wants and needs, the exchange rate of good debt and bad debt, high level. Again, this is a subject we can cover in 45 minutes in and of itself. But on a high level, good debt versus bad debt, good debt you need. Do you need to take out $1,000 to go get an outfit for the party this weekend? Probably not. Do you need to take out student loans to go to college? Yeah, okay, that's, that's an understandable piece. The second one would be interest rate. We just talked about credit cards being 18%. If it's over 5%, it's not good debt. Payday loans are 100, 200%, don't do those. That's an easy one, that's a definite bad debt. But an interest rate, when it gets 5% or lower, you at least have a conversation around if it's good or bad. The return, why did you need it? Did you need to go buy a lawnmower to start a lawn mowing company? That's a need. Did I need to take out a student loan to go get a, stock, to go get a, a degree? That's a need. And then tax refund. Don't get too lost in that one, but certain debt is gonna actually give you some deduction back on taxes. Don't too worry about that. Quick question. Of the five buckets, what do you think is the happy bucket? Present. Your present choices, I'm going to spend, I'm enjoying it. I got two nods on present, anybody else have a guess? Mm. She's waking up. Do you expect the Dalai Lama to show up? No. <laughs> Gotta keep on the toes. This practice says, you want to be happy, practice compassion. You want others to be happy, practice compassion. This is scientifically proven in our brains now. What you give will grow and it makes you happy. Compassion is much like a smile and is much like a thank you. They don't change one day, they are magical, they change two days. You smile at someone, you smile, they smile, that's magic. Practice compassion, say thank you. There's a teacher here on campus that you may not be fond of all the time, but they are here to help you. Go ahead and say thank you to them. See if you don't make their day, and if in turn that kind of makes your day a little bit too. I'm not saying that teacher has to be in the room. Fine, it would be nice. So the happy bucket, compassion. I don't want everybody to walk out and say, that dude came in here and told me to give all my money away. No, 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 no. I'm talking about building a habit. Start with 1%. I made $100, I'm gonna get $1 away. And it doesn't even have to be money. If you wanna equate it to something about your time, your talent, or your treasure, I delivered this a few weeks ago and a young man said, you know what? I'm gonna start going to local uh, uh, sporting events and de dedicating my, my picture, I take photography. I said, that's compassion, boom, done. You filled your bucket. So when you make a million dollars a year, if you built this habit as you started, it will already be part of your process and your system. That's what I want to focus on. The compassion challenge would be to get a group of friends, all put in $10 or all put in an hour, and go see one group of people you want to impact. Next to your name, next to your rich goal, write one thing you want to be passionate about, to go show compassion to. It could be a group of people, it could be a cause, it could be whatever you want. Something in your heart that you say, I wouldn't mind giving to this. We're gonna go through month three, the last month. We know we gotta start with net income. We know we're gonna automate some of our past choices attacking credit card debt. When you see this monthly debt payment, you can increase that, that's your choice. And then you're gonna practice some compassion and when we get to the last category, we'll talk about being some.
So go ahead and make your three choices. How much more credit did you want to pay down? What's your total? And then what's your lifestyle for? Wait, how much is it for me again? The amount of time? The 2,800 So you're getting your, in, your same income. The B1, so your month one choices are going to stay with you. And then your month three choices are this month's choices. And then we're going to talk a little bit about investments. Always end up the fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so All right, so I'm gonna let you guys on your own choose what you want to spend, save, and give this month. The random event this month, you all have a place, you had some friends over, one of your friends broke the sink, the sink started to flood. You now gotta fix the sink and the flood. Look at your month one, see what kind of insurance you got. Did you get full insurance coverage? Did any of you guys do the full coverage? Good work. You got $25 that you have to pay for the deductible. Did anybody do the minimum coverage? You save some money, all right. You're gonna have to spend $200 because you gotta have some money come out of pocket above the deductible. Did anybody risk it and say, I'm going to self-insure, I don't want any insurance? No? Good for you. The first insurance policy you're going to have in investments, in your finances, in your personal story, is going to be this term called an emergency fund. I'm working on a cooler term for this because it's not very fun, but Right now, you can't really think of anything more clever because this is your first insurance policy. Your emergency fund is the buffer that you need to build in between you and what happens in life. Half of Americans today can't cover a $400 emergency for a few reasons. Number one, they don't have an emergency fund. Number two, they don't know how to use money. Number three, they also might be in a tougher situation. But it's gonna focus around this burn rate. We're gonna talk about that here in a second. But three to six months of your burn rate or what you spend, that's your emergency fund. So your future self, pay yourself first. Pay yourself first. I'm gonna say it one last time. Pay yourself first. This is very important. As we start to look at driving our car, we need to realize paying ourselves first is very important. Compound interest. Albert Einstein deemed it the eighth wonder of the world, second Google fund. Google seven wonders of the world, very interesting. Eighth one of the world, this idea of compound interest. He thought it was so important that he said, anybody who understands it finds ways to earn it. Anybody who doesn't, pays it. I'll go back to the credit card for one last time. If you don't understand compound interest, you are comfortable paying credit card debt. What is compound interest? That is, if I invested something, $1,000 for 20 years and I'm getting 10%, I'm getting my principal, what I invested, is earning 10% interest every year, I'm gonna end up with $3,000. By using the eighth wonder, 
Albert Einstein's eighth wonder of the world, he said, don't just let your principal go to work for you, but all these new employees that you've been creating, let those work for you as well. They're gonna create their own employees and you're gonna almost triple your money by using this concept, this principle of finance, the eighth wonder of the world, compound interest. Does this make sense? This is a big one. All right. As you look at it, I want you to start saying, okay, what is what should I be saving? What is my goals? Like I said, a lot of people are not paying themselves first. So as we look at savings, 16,000 in their 20s, 30s, 45,000 in your 40s, 63,000, people say that's what they save a year? No, that's what they have saved on average in America today. Why? Well, in your 20s, you gotta get out of student loan debt. In your 30s, you get married and everybody starts spending more money. And in your 40s, you wanna go get a bigger, nicer house. So every decade, you're facing a new kind of Jones. You're trying to keep up, you're trying to play, and they're not paying themselves first. We're gonna do that. So if I were changing these buckets around, I would take my goal, my save, my rich goal, and I would put it even above the income. I would put it up here. The only way I can guarantee to make my goal is by putting it first and paying myself first. So as we look at this, I just gave you a high level goal savings. Number one, get out of credit card debt. I think we can all agree that he's talked about that enough. At a minimum, go get free money. Where's free money? Thank you for asking. We'll get to that in a second. 20 to 25, you start out at 10%. Here's something you should write down. I made a dollar, I saved a dime. I made a dollar, I saved a dime. That is the first step. Now, you went from a spendor to a savedor. We're about to take that next step to become investor. And then you get up to 12%. Ideally, I wanna get you up to 15% with an emergency fund and you'll be off and sailing. So anybody can give me two points for creativity on this slide? The older gen, you guys get it? These are all bonds. Stocks and bonds. Thank you, thank you. All right. So stocks and bonds, where are we gonna to start to go earn that eighth wonder of the world? In stocks and bonds. Stocks and bonds are also known as a bond is debt, a stock is equity. Bond is debt, stock is equity. What kind of ownership comes with these two relationships? Well, with the bond, I'm giving you debt and you are now my, I am a lender. With the stock, I am buying ownership in your company, equity, and I am now a partner. So I'm either a lender or a partner with bonds and stocks. The payment, I'm gonna get interest on my loan or I'm gonna get part ownership of the growth or the fall of the company. The risk and expectation, Bonds are lower risk, lower reward. Stocks are higher risk, higher reward. First rule on investing, higher the risk, higher the reward, higher the possibility of losing. So bonds and stocks are the first two ways we're gonna to start to go earn compound interest. How do you go about buying bonds and stocks? You can go buy them one at a time, single. I wanna go buy company X. Maybe this company X was Amazon 15 years ago. Good guess, you crushed it. If it was one of the other 999 companies, you didn't do as well and you probably lost some money. The potential is you have huge growth and you also have huge downside. That's if you go single. Well, I don't wanna do that. How do I do better than that? Then we're gonna get introduced to mutual funds and exchange traded funds or ETFs. For the time being, same thing. Don't worry about the difference between these two. But that says, I don't wanna buy just one. I wanna buy a couple companies or a couple bonds. I don't want just company or bond X, I want W, X, Y, and Z. And what this does is it gives you a little diversification and it also gives you a professional money manager. It also has somebody go and invest that money for you. Now with that manager, you gotta pay them. So that's a little bit of a disadvantage. And then the idea around diversification is a little skewed because if all four of these companies do the exact same thing, that's not diversified. So you gotta be careful with a mutual fund that you want to make sure that it has some diversification. So being a little too concentrated. Now, if you say, okay, I get that. I like the diversification thing. I also want to get some returns. What would be even the next step and possibly better for me? We're going to introduce you to the index fund. So I don't want to just buy one. I don't want to buy a company. I want to buy them all. I want companies A through Z, not just W, X, Y, and Z. 
That's an index. This is the most diversified. It's also going to be the lowest fees, but it's not as high of a risk. So it's not as high of a reward as either of these two. So that's a little bit of a downside. But if we want to talk to Russell Investments, who makes their money on these two categories, they create these index funds that says you can be a part owner of every company in America. You could be a part owner of every company in America. You could be a part owner of every company outside of America. You could be a part owner of every company outside and inside of America. That means you can have millions of people working for you all the time. When I go to sleep, my money is working for me. Not only is that money working for me, but the employees that money is creating is working for me. Think about that. I can have millions of people working for me because I believe that they're all out there trying to grow their business. Now, the last question is, where am I gonna go buy them? So you begin with just a way to be ordinarily taxed treatment, and it's called a brokerage account. This is how this works. I went and made money, we all understand, I made money, I'm gonna get taxed. It's gonna be invested, it's gonna grow, 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 and when I use money, I'm gonna be taxed. I'm gonna be taxed twice on it. So that's the disadvantage. But the advantage is I have full access today, and it's making money. If I don't wanna be taxed twice, how do I stop that? Well, then we're gonna get into tax deferred or 401ks and IRAs. All this is, is I work for a company or I work for myself. IRA stands for individual retirement account. So I work for a company, I work for myself, and this big bold letters right here, free money. Go get this free money. If you work for a company that has a 401k, they're gonna offer you an employer match. It's buy none, the best investment you can make. Why? Because it will be 100% return for you. If you put in 3%, they put in 3%, you now have 6%, that's 100% return. Maximize your free money. Make sure you go get free money. The tax, the disadvantage is this saying, I'm kicking the bucket down the road. I don't wanna be taxed today. So this one was, I made money, I'm taxed. It's gonna grow, it's gonna be taxed again. Ta uh, 401k tax deferred, it says, nah, I made it, but don't tax me yet. Let it be invested, invested, invested. When I use it down the road, then you can tax it. Is there a better solution to even that? That's a good one. For you and your time frame. if you have earned income, you're gonna be introduced to this idea of Roth accounts. I start making money, I can start contributing to a Roth account. And what is this, big bold, bold letters? Tax-free for life, tax-free for life. So Roth account says, I'm in this, the first or second scoop of ice cream income tax bracket. I'm okay being taxed today because once I make money, I'm taxed on it, put it into my Roth vehicle, it never gets taxed again. When I use it, when it goes down, when it goes wherever, it never gets taxed again. So a Roth is a huge advantage for you at this time. You have two huge advantages. To any investor, time is the greatest asset tool you have for you. The second one might be a Roth account. So a Roth account is huge. Any questions on this slide? All right, last one we're gonna go over real briefly, the golden rule. I love this example. You're off in the middle of the woods, you have a wood burning stove that's gonna keep you warm all through winter because winter is coming. Game of Thrones, thank you. Didn't think that was coming either. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I have very low expectations. If I get one smile or chuckle, I win. So, <laughs> it always is good. So you have this wood fire stove. I'm going out, I'm collecting wood. I'm going earning all this wood and I'm starting to stockpile it. When the first freeze of winter comes, I start throwing wood on the pile. And all of a sudden I ask myself, do I have enough wood supply to make it through winter? Or am I burning through my, my supply too fast? That is the golden rule of personal finance. Am I spending more than I make? Am I spending more than my wood supply? If you walk out of here and say, what was the golden rule of personal finance? The golden rule is do not spend more than you make. The way people break this, credit cards. Very simple. So what is that burn rate? That's how much money you're actually spending this month. That's your burn rate. How much money you're throwing onto the fire. And the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is the power of your choices. We went through a series of choices, a series of lessons, a lot of things. I wanna take some stuff out of this, but I don't know what to take out. The last thing is the power of $5 choice. Everybody's not gonna point to which coffee shop they go to, but there's a very famous one here in town. $5, I go get my latte every morning. See, it works. 
Five dollars I go get over a 30 year time frame. How much coffee do you think I've bought over those 30 years? How much? So many. If we're going to equate it to a dollar amount, it'd be fifty-four thousand dollars of coffee. Fifty-four thousand seven hundred fifty dollars of coffee. Now, power up my five-dollar choice. What if I were to throw those five dollars into an index fund, let it grow on average at ten percent, the average return to the market for the next thirty years? What would that fifty-four thousand dollar coffee's opportunity cost be? What would I have been giving up? What do you want to guess on that? What? Wait, How much do you think that five dollar a day choice would be, would turn into? I thought you were giving up. Yeah. If you choose this one, you're giving up the copy, and hopefully you see it in a second, maybe make the decision sometime. I want a good guess. Fifty-four thousand dollars a copy or seventy thousand. Seventy thousand, five dollars a day. Any other good guesses? Three hundred and forty-three thousand dollars of free. <laughs> what is the power of your choice today? This is the opportunity cost of your decisions. The opportunity cost of your decisions. Do you understand? Do you strategize and are you efficiently using your money? So now we see the money buckets. I reorganize them because we're going to pay our future self first. Then we got to make sure to pay society. We're going to target our past choices. We're even going to work in a little bit of our compassion and our present choices. If you wanted a high level understanding of what I would hope for you in these categories as you began your jobs and off to college, that would be the percentages that fill up these buckets. Any questions? We won't go through this right now, but this would be how you strategize into it. I can email this to you if you're interested. What I love, and we have some feedback. Number one, why I'm doing this is because I didn't have this class, but the class wasn't out there. So through the NFL, through some of my education and experience, I try to go build it. We also, I go into companies now and deliver financial education to around estate planning, tax planning, retirement planning, a bunch of different things. But this is my passion. I think one of you will have learned something and it will change your life. That's cool. So number one, if you want to do Twitter, I'm not on Instagram yet, long story, we're getting the video system, I'm gonna start doing Instagram stuff. LinkedIn, you might be right before the LinkedIn thing, but once you get into college, start LinkedIn-ing with people, and definitely connect with me. And if you have questions, or you want to receive some of the content we're gonna start sending out, give us your email, and you'll get onto that email list. That's your decision. Uh, but mostly what I would love is if I were to come back, what questions or topics you would want to be covered. Uh, we're, we've built out level two, but we also don't want to not pay attention to the audience. Mm -hmm. So uh, the answer to the first question you had, was it A? It was A by about $60,000. 600 to 540. So just think if you could save $5,000 from 20 to 25, what it would do. You guys got two minutes. Any other questions, comments? Was this somewhat more entertaining than you were expecting? Yes? Good question. So I was a tight end and a fullback in college, and then the NFL, they looked at me and said, you're definitely not playing tight end, so I became a fullback. Uh, but in 2011, I was the number one fullback in the game, making me the best in the world. So I, I kind of take pride in that. Did you go to the Pro Bowl? I got to go to the Pro Bowl. <laughs> Gotta have some fun with it, right? No, no, no. I don't want to scare you.
No. Uh, the book's called Teach Me Money, and it's the first 10 questions you should ask in your financial journey. Some of them we answered, a lot of them we didn't have time for. So thank you guys very much. You got the little questionnaires, and you'll pass them forward here. And thank you so very much for yeah. spending the morning with us. Thank you. And I, I'm hoping that they can see that uh, you know, this is something that's not too soon for people their age to be able to start thinking about driving their own car. Yeah, I like it. <laughs>